UX design, we might as well get right into what we're talking about here just to set the boundaries of the topic. User experience design, uh, for the rest of the night we'll be calling it just UX, right? Uh, is the process of enhancing user satisfaction with a product by improving the usability, accessibility, and pleasure provided in the interaction with the product. Now, I'm not exactly sure how helpful the definition is. I feel like it's a little bit broad, um, so it's probably helpful to get more into some details. But I don't know, just as a foundation, maybe this is a good place to start. I would also point out that this doesn't mean that UX is not marketing but they are often treated as two different disciplines, even within the same company. For example, at, at the place where I work now, there is a UX team, and then there's a marketing team, and they sit in different parts of the building. Sometimes we talk, oftentimes we don't. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, um, but just know that these are considered to be, to be two different disciplines, but also very closely related. Um, and I would say the you know, there are different ways to describe the key difference. Um, I would say one way to describe it is that, you know, of course, when you're, when you're talking about marketing, you're talking a lot about conversions. You're talking a lot about um, the person who is in the mindset to make a purchase, right? Spend some money. Um, but UX is not primarily focused on purchasing. It's focused on the experience of using the product, right? Sometimes, you know, you're going to Amazon and you're purchasing things um, and then the experience is an experience of buying. So that really blurs the lines. But just know that these are primarily the two, uh, this would be how you differentiate between the two disciplines, I think. The, this notion of designing something, you know, as, as you're a designer, you're often designing something in order to sell, right? Maybe you're trying to sell a product. Or maybe you're even just trying to sell an idea, right? You're trying to sell an idea to decision makers. That's one way to design, and you design in a certain way. That's not always the same thing as designing something to be used, right? Sometimes something that's very easy to use, it wouldn't really sell very well. Um, and I'll show you what I mean here. Beautiful designs with poor usability. Maybe start thinking of things in your life that you've seen at the store that you think are beautiful or maybe it's a website or an app or another type of experience. And you think, wow, that's beautiful. I need to have that. But then you bring it home and start using it, and it just starts to feel frustrating, right? Uh, it just starts making you mad. Maybe you can't think of those things. That's OK, too. But I'll pu pull out one example. So I won't, I won't name the, automo the automobile company here. But uh, this was around the year 1999. They came up with this uh, way of interacting with the car. So you would be the driver. You would have this very simple looking dial, right? And you know, I guess you'll be driving and you start turning the dial and you've got a screen on your dashboard and it was all very new at the time, this, this many levels deep of interaction. You could do all kinds of different things with your car. The radio, the nav system, you know, the early iterations of the nav system. And I would argue that that's, that's a pretty nice looking uh, interactive piece right there, that little dial. Um, What's the problem, though? What happened to my arrow keys? So I redacted the name of the company. That's why those black rectangles are there. But uh, you see the date here, October 1st, 2003. U.S. could ban the dial thing. Um, what was going on here? So it was too complicated. You're trying to drive your car, and you've got this beautiful looking thing, and you're, you're like, you know, you're storing all of this information in your brain when you're supposed to be driving. It was enough of a safety hazard that the government got involved and they said, well, maybe, maybe this isn't such a good thing. So this is an example of something that was designed to be beautiful, but difficult to use. And now you can go and buy something to update your little dial. And you can see what they've done here. To make it easier to use, they've gone in and added extra little arrows, extra buttons things so that you don't have to keep all the information in your brain. You can, you know, and there's, there's a little bit more of a tactile sense. You can, you can tap the different buttons. And this was able to survive the legal, you know, the government looking at what they're doing. And it made it easier to use. It still doesn't look that bad, I don't think. But not nearly as minimalist, not nearly as beautiful as before. While working in enterprise software, 
So this is software that's meant to be used by people who are, who are doing their work, right? Somebody is working as a news editor or a marketer or a car dealer. They're getting up every morning. They're sitting down at their computer. They're using this software, right? So that's enterprise software. Lately, all of that, I shouldn't say lately, all of that has been going online. So we're now in the business of making websites that, that host this software, right? So who do they hire to do that? Website designers, right? Um, sounds like a good idea to me. What's been, what I've seen happen multiple times is, you know, you'll be, you'll be a website designer. You're motivated to have a nice looking portfolio. You want to make things look beautiful. Of course, of course. So you see this software and it has all of this information on this ugly looking thing and everything is very close together and it's very confusing when you first start looking at it. So what's your instinct? You want to start taking things and hiding them. You want to start cleaning them up. You want to start adding more space in between the items. We call that data density. And you get to this point where it's like, oh man, yeah, this looks great. This looks so much better than before. Um, and then, and I've seen it happen in at least two different companies, three different products where you launch it to your user. And now the same people are going to work. They want to use the same software that they were using yesterday. And suddenly they couldn't find anything exactly. Um, or if they could, you know, now you've got to scroll through and find it. You've got to go to different. So I've seen multiple cases where, you know, we've made things look beautiful and then we've had to. Uh, reverse in our decisions, right? And so you sort of end up somewhere in between. So designing to sell versus designing to be used. And by the way, when those beautiful designs get shown to the decision makers in the company, many times they, they like them and they think it looks good. Or maybe it looks good at the trade show. It looks good in the commercials. It's just people don't like to use it. So what happens if you go in the other direction? Of course, that means you should fit as much on the screen as you possibly can, right? Well, let's, let's consider the opposite extreme where it's like, okay, I don't know of any consumer who would want to purchase something that looks like this. You've got every single possible thing that you can do, maybe things you rarely do, but they're all showing at the same time. Every gauge, every switch, everything is, is all there. This is an older 747. I would say the only reason this really worked is because they didn't really need to sell this to anybody, right? Um, and the people using it, pilots, how many hours does a pilot need in order to start flying these things for real? Many hundreds of hours where they need to practice. Consider healthcare professionals and the complicated uh, things that they use. It's really very complicated. You know, there has to be somewhere in between. And so that's where we, we start to realize we probably need to think about seeking the right balance. I heard it mentioned earlier where you want to have a, I think the word was crisp. You do want to have a crisp design for your, for your blog or for what, whatever it is you're working on, but you don't want to make it so difficult that it's difficult to use. So somewhere in the middle, you get it right. And this brings to mind something which, which I discovered recently. Um, there's actually a word for this idea where it's the aesthetic usability effect. And that refers to users' tendency to perceive attractive products as more usable. People tend to believe that things that look better will work better, even if they aren't actually more effective or efficient. So, I mean, what's easier to use, Apple or Android? <laughs> uh, people, people argue either way. You know, there's no. We're not going to answer that question tonight. But I would say that you know, Apple has the history of of making things like look nice. And even if it's actually, even if it actually takes longer to do something, the person using it will believe that it's easier because it looks nice. You know, people are people are funny. Um, <laughs> I would, you know, this is the second part of this though. Um, so bear in mind that the aesthetic usability effect has its limits. A pretty design can make users more forgiving of minor usability problems, but not of larger ones, right? So I'll leave that up for, for a minute. So it's, if you make something look nice, you do get some goodwill from people, but only up to a point. If you go too far, you're going to have problems again. 
And so started mentioning it earlier. Apple is an example of this. You know, they've got, they have a long history of, um, you know, taking things that already exist, making them look nice, and then they sell, you know, but people will buy them and they pay more money for them, even if it's harder to use. There's the, you know, the MP3 player was a thing. This was already a thing. And then they came out with the iPod many years ago and the iPod kind of took on a life of its own, right? The same thing with smartphones. Smartphones existed, but uh, many people will say that it was the iPhone that kind of pulled it into the mainstream. It still, it took me a long time to realize you could use a flashlight. Like I felt so stupid, but you know, they hide these things in funny ways that you can't find them. There's no signifier, there's no affordance. You just somehow need to know that it's there. Um, but it works well enough that they sell. But all right, enough about that. I think you get the point. Selling versus using, but uh, oh yeah, this slide. So this is the deep dive into UX now. Some basics here, right? The first rule of UX, and I see it broken all the time. I see people who have been working in the field for many years forgetting about this rule number one. You are not your user. If you like something, that's great but you better make sure that your user also likes it, right? And there are ways, there are techniques uh, to, to verify that, that we talk about in a couple minutes. The sec, oh, I, I've got two more. So the second is uh, don't reinvent the wheel, right? If you're working on a blog and you start creating something that doesn't look like a blog that anyone would recognize, if you start being completely original, you know, don't kill your creative spirit, but, Realize that for things that are interactive, for things that people will need to use and understand, if you start creating something which is brand new, how, how many years has the internet been around? Many of these problems have already been solved. And we as internet users already understand most of what's going on on the internet. If you start creating a new icon or a new element, it's a risk. For all I know, you might use it to get rich and you're the first person to think of it. But usually, you're just gonna end up confusing people. So I would really start with things that exist already, right? And then finally, be generous. Um, I guess what I mean by that is if, if you if you're, think you're gonna trick people into using your product and they're not really gonna be getting any enough back from it, then in the digital world at least, people can very, very easily go and start using something else. So the more you give, the more you get in the digital world, right? You are not your user. I'll just get a little bit deeper into this, right? These points. There's actually a name for that. This is called the false consensus effect. And this refers to people's tendency to assume that others share their beliefs and will behave similarly in a given context. You know, it's a busy city. We see people all the time. I think we assume that they're all going to make the same decisions that we're going to make. And it's, it's, it, needs to be, it needs to be tested in order to be, to be true, right? Don't reinvent the wheel. And I guess the vocabulary word or phrase here would be design patterns. Um, design is a very vague word, and patterns are a very vague word. But when you put them together, you get design patterns, which refer to very specifically uh, descriptions of best practices within user interface design. And these are general reusable solutions to commonly occurring problems. Right? And be generous, right? This quote I like, a man named Alan Cooper, software designer. If we want users to like our software, we should design it to behave like a likable person, right? Respectful, generous, and helpful. Have you ever been on a website where it's like you get the pop-up that disrupts what you're working on and it says like sign up for our newsletter and then the other button says no I don't want to know all these great things you want to tell me it gives you some kind of like snarky way out of the modal and it's like how do you feel about that company how do you feel about that experience it's like would you want if that experience was a person would you want to go have a coffee with them no <laughs> you're being a jerk don't be a jerk so I divided this up. There are so many different techniques that we can talk about tonight. Divided this up into um, a couple of key areas. The first is knowing your organization. In real life, you're going to be working with all kinds of stakeholders. If you're working on a digital product, you've got people in the company 
uh, you've, you've, how is this thing going to make money? The bosses of the company or some leadership is going to be involved. Otherwise, you wouldn't be working on the, the thing, I assume. Um, who are your technology stakeholders? Are these really, fr you know, really forward-thinking developers? Are they going to be limited in the technology that they're using? These are all different people that you need to talk to and understand the business goals, the technology boundaries. And um, so the definition of stakeholder interviews, a wide spanning set of semi-structured interviews with anyone who has an interest in the project's success. They say also that your users is part of this. I would say yes, but your users kind of get their own special treatment in addition to this. Knowing the playing field, right? The first step anybody should be taking after understanding what the project is, is to go out and understand who your competitors are, um, who else is out there doing something similar to you. And once in a while, I'll work with somebody and they'll say, this is a brand new idea. Nobody else is doing this. I say, that's not true. <laughs> I say, even if nobody is doing exactly what you're doing, there are people out there doing something similar, um, even in a general way. So you need to go out there and understand what they're working on. That doesn't mean you need to go and copy what other people are doing. In fact, you probably shouldn't do that. Um, but if you don't know what they're doing, how can you avoid accidentally copying, right? If you're working on an e-commerce website uh, and everybody's using the shopping cart, maybe you don't want to use a shopping cart, you want to do something different, but you need to know that everybody's using the shopping cart to make that decision. Think of that across all of your decisions. Think of what you'll learn from looking at your competitors and sort of uh, very carefully documenting what you're seeing, right? Take, take screenshots, take videos. Um, you could even um, ask people to use a competing website. And the reason why you should do that is you might see that five companies are all doing the same thing. But maybe they all got it wrong. Maybe they're all just copying each other and they all got it wrong. So a UX competitor analysis involves assessing competitor sites to see how they design for their users, potentially solving for similar user needs. Knowing your user, right? So to me, this is one of the most exciting parts of the job. Um, when I was get it, first getting started, I was much more of like a graphic designer. And I would kind of create designs based on what my boss wanted or you know what other people wanted. And I was always asking them, well, can you tell me more about the person using the product? And they always tried to. They always tried to give me more details, but it was never really enough. And then over time, the UX field started to mature. And so I started to realize, oh, wait a minute. There's this whole other avenue where you can work with your user. You can understand what they want directly and build the design based on that. And you can show it in data. And that means that when your boss is telling you to do something different, you can say, actually, we spoke to the user and we know that this works. That changes the conversation completely. And as a designer, that gives you a lot more power. That gives you a seat at the table at your job. So, so to me, this was, this was a big, big change in my career. So knowing your user. There are so many different ways to know your user. User interviews are one. Um, and this is more of... Have you covered at all uh, like qualitative versus quantitative information? Qualitative sort of involves working directly with people, um, understanding the reasons why they're doing things, understanding their motivations. Of course, you can't talk to hundreds of people. <laughs> You'll be out of business. So you talk to some people and then quantitative, and I'll get to that in a minute, quantitative is more like looking at Google Analytics looking at the numbers, how many people have clicked. And if you have qualitative, where you're talking with people, and then you have quantitative, the numbers, you can use the two of those things together to really make a successful product. But anyway, back to user interviews. This is qualitative, right? User interviews are where a researcher or a UX designer or hybrid designer researcher asks questions of and records responses from users. It's always nice to have a video when you're working with people, capture what they're doing on their screen. And so the user interviews can be used to examine the user experience. 
the usability of the product or to flesh out demographic or ethnographic data for input into user personas, among many other things. Right? Testing your ideas, right? So imagine that you've, you, you think you know what you need to build, right? You've spoken to enough people, you have your persona, you've looked at competitors, you start drawing things on napkins, right? You start having all of these ideas. You say, well, I know, I know what we need to build. I know what they're going to like. Uh, at that point, you can start putting together something called a prototype. And the prototype can be just a drawing. It could be something on, on, uh, online. You can create a fake website very quickly. You can, it's kind of a simulation. That way, you don't have to build the whole thing. The point is, think of a way that you can easily share your ideas with your user. And once you have that together, you can start showing people. If you're creating, I don't know, an, an e-commerce website, you can say, all right, imagine that you want to buy a pair of shoes. Here, here's, here's our creation. Try to buy a pair of shoes. And you can watch them do it. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> you know, Don't say, if they start clicking on the wrong place, don't say anything. You have to just watch them do it. Uh, and that's a difficult part. Um, but you want to watch them accomplish this task, and you're going to learn a lot. Because all of the things that you think you know about this experience, all you're going to think that you're right in the beginning. And after the first two or three people, you realize, OK, I got to fix that thing. I need to fix this other thing. I'd like you to imagine that you have recently learned about a new online tool that you can use to see key pieces of information associated with the Beautiful Me program. Okay. So I would say without tapping on anything just yet, if you could please take another 60 seconds or so to tell me what you see here and what it means to you. Uh, filter info on the bottom and change dates. I'm not sure what that's for. Oh, I guess if I want to change dates to see that monthly participation, and then I can filter information from within here. The Beautiful Me participation rate is, is everything. Um, I wish I could click on it and see how many I've personally done. That would be so cool. Now, I'm curious why it says cross bookings. That's a little confusing to me. Does cross bookings mean sites who had Beautiful Me who also brought in raising a beautiful child? If you had to take a guess, what would you expect that to be? I mean, it kind of looks like in between May 1st and May 31st, we had about 43 people attend a Raising a Beautiful Child and about 30 attend and Empower Me. So I just want to say the, the level of detail, the fact that you're saying so much and it's all good stuff, this is perfect. Oh, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No Please problem. continue. Uh, just as you're doing Usually it. Usually I'm told to shush. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Based uh, on what you're seeing now, um, imagine you want to see the specific numbers of participants from, let's say, May 12. I get this another kid, actually. Oh, wow, check that out. Okay. So I would go to date range would be that. Well, yeah, that, that's, pretty, um, that's pretty easy to find. Um, please set it to show information from PS1234. I'm trying to tap on all sites, but when I every time I tap it, it just... Oh, is it supposed to light up red like that? Because it doesn't work. Or is it supposed to change? Sites, or I, oh, I probably should have gone to filter info. Yeah, that would have made more sense. I'm sorry, and then put in PS. Oh, maybe the PS... One, two, three, four in here. Oh, see, now that's cool. Because when you get to there, you can click on the self-sustaining and see what they're doing. So you can see, first of all, that this is not a finished website. It's gray. It's a simulation of a website. Um, and that's because you need to build them quickly and learn quickly. Otherwise, your competition is going to learn faster than you and eventually you're going to lose business, right? So you need to be fast. However, imagine if you skip this, how many things, how many things can you learn by showing this to five different people? And if everybody, if everybody says that this is no problem, then you know that it's okay and you can build it. You can build it with confidence. But if three of the people 
said, I don't understand this, or if you watch them and they don't understand what's going on, then you probably need to go back to the drawing board and fix it, right? And the, the good news is you can fix it before you start spending money on the developers, on the people who make the, the website, the people who make the code. You can start doing this before they start working on it because they're very expensive, okay? <laughs> and you want to save that money along the way. And now, I started talking about this before with the qualitative versus the quantitative. Um, this is the numbers part. And if you're a big company like Amazon or Google or Facebook, you've got many, many millions of users, which means you can make a tiny little change and you get lots and lots of numbers to tell you if you made the right decision, right? The good news is you don't need to be that big of a company to start to see these benefits. Um, so let's imagine you're creating something, you're creating a digital experience. You've looked at all your competitors, so you have a good understanding of what's out there. You've spoken to your users, you understand their motivations. You've created something fast, and you've shown it to people, so you understand now. You think you know where the biggest problems were, and you fixed the biggest problems. Now what you can do is you can launch it to, and I don't know how many users you have, maybe you can launch it to 10% of your users, right? You could launch it to 100%, but that's a risk, right? You should probably start with 10% if you, can, if you think you can get enough data from that. And that's web analytics. That's called web analytics. So web analytics is the measurement and analysis of data to inform an understanding of user behavior across web pages. And this is from a company called Optimizely. If I change, the, the classic example is, if I change this button from green to red, will it make more people click on it? You know, it's kind of, I don't know why you would change a button from green to red. Maybe it works, probably not. But there are lots and lots of different things you can do to see which ideas work, which ideas don't. The nice thing about working uh, in the digital world is you can get these answers very quickly. There are methods, you know, you want to make sure you keep, keep the test open for seven days just in case, you know, people act differently on the weekend. Um, of course, there are all these techniques. But if you start to learn about web analytics and start to understand um, all of the different rules around it, you can really, you can really do some, some good things. And one other thing I want to point out there, many people will talk about an A-B test. But it's essentially you've got choice A and choice B. And you put them out there, and which one does better? But uh, so yeah, that's um, those are some basic techniques. Um, there are so many more details in there. So I hope that this overview was helpful.